This is a happier story. This is a story about getting very significant, as it were, market penetration of the European language portfolio to support the teaching of English as a second language in, in our primary schools. We reckon that there are about 10,000 portfolios in use among a total population of 10,000. There's no obligation to use it, but on the whole teachers want to, and principals want them to, and so on and so forth. And this is how it works. The context is as you can see on that screen, and you probably know this already, since the 1990s, especially since the later 1990s, we've had wave after wave of immigrants coming to Ireland. This is a new experience for Irish culture and society, which of course, on the whole, has thought in terms of emigration rather than immigration. Uh, some of the immigrants are asylum seekers, which means that they don't have the legal right to work whereas others come in on the basis of work permits already issued to them, or if they come in as refugees, they have basically citizenship rights. But whatever the status of the parents, all children and adolescents who are resident in the state are expected to go to school. As I've just said, s about 12,000 pupils in primary schools whose L1 is not English or Irish. Now, the Department of Education and Science, in its infinite wisdom, decided when this first became an issue that it would deal with this on a withdrawal basis. Someone somewhere said, all right, we've got these kids, they can't speak English, what do we do? We'll pull them out of the mainstream class once a day, we'll give them extra English, and we'll do that for two years. As far as I know, no one with any knowledge of education, far less language learning, was, was consulted on this, but that was the that was the thing that was put in place. Um, and on the whole, they get one class a day, and, and they get it for two years. And, and then there's a funding model. You get so much money to buy in extra teaching hours if you have up to seven, but you get nothing for the first two. So if you have two non-English speaking immigrant children, you get nothing. Between three and seven, you get X, between 8 and 13 you get 2X, 14 you get another teacher, get to 28 you get two teachers, get to 42 you get three teachers. So you can imagine the principals doing their sums and standing on street corners in September. <laughs> the government has, has invested hugely in this. By last year there were nearly 2,000 special teaching posts, that's a very, very big commitment uh, and with a downturn in the economy there's going to be pressure I'm sure on, on maintaining that. In 2000 Integrate Island Language and Training, this not-for-profit campus company that uh, I'd set up, was approached by the department and said well you've got the adult sector a bit under control now, will you do something for the schools? So we agreed that we would discuss with them what we might do. And they said, well, what do you want to do? So we said, well, there's no curriculum in place, so we really need to devise a curriculum. And when we've devised a curriculum, we need to develop learning and teaching supports, and we need to have assessment in mind, and we've got to mediate that to the teachers, so we'll need to run a, a rolling program of in-service seminars. So at home somewhere, I've got another of these things on file, uh, ostensibly from the Minister, saying that that's what we were to do. When we started thinking about the curriculum, we thought, well, it's got to reflect the purpose of English as a Second Language support, which is to give pupils access to the mainstream curriculum. What happens outside the school, outside the classroom, is, is a secondary issue. We wanted to describe learning progression we didn't want something that simply talked about final outcomes. We wanted to describe learning progression in a way that would correspond intuitively to teachers' experience. We needed to present it in a form that would encourage and facilitate frequent use. Uh, our official 
primary curriculum is a significant work of educational research, but it's in many volumes. It can't be lifted by one person alone, and therefore the extent to which it's closely studied by the teaching profession is limited. <laughs> we wanted it to be expressed in terms that would quite explicitly support a communicative pedagogy and the development by ourselves but also by others of communicative learning materials. And of course we wanted to foster the development of learner autonomy. Not just because we thought it was a good thing, but it is a general goal, it's a stated goal of the Irish primary curriculum. And we wanted in any case, thinking in terms of the way I conceive of, of, of learner autonomy, to focus on the development of metacognitive, metalinguistic awareness on the part of these migrant learners because they're going to continue developing their English way beyond the two-year limit of their special support. So having had those thoughts, we thought, well, the Common European Framework of Reference is, is an obvious model and source for us to work with here. English language proficiency benchmarks, of course, this is a homage to Canada, as I said earlier, um, turn out to be a reworking of the first three levels of the framework to make them age-appropriate and domain-specific. Why the first three levels? Well, B1 is threshold level. That's the level at which the learner is alleged to be capable of independent communicative behavior within the target community. Uh, and that seemed to us to fit what we were up to. In any case, I think that there is a problem in making the higher levels age appropriate. I think A1, A2, B1 can be without undue distortion rewritten for young learners. But when you go beyond B1, you're going beyond general language learning. You're beginning to move into the kind of issues that you pick up on in bilingual and immersion programs at the higher levels of proficiency and the extent to which you can write B1, far less C1 or C2, for a seven-year-old seems to be pretty well zero in my view. In part one of our benchmarks, we've got two grids, just like the self-assessment grid, except that there are just three levels, A1, A2, and B1. Global benchmarks of communicative proficiency, listening, reading, spoken interaction, spoken production, and writing. But then cutting across that, global scales of underlying linguistic competence, again derived from the framework, simply vocabulary, grammar, phonology, and orthography. Phonology, orthography, of course, for listening and speaking on the one side, reading and writing on the other. And then the second part of these benchmarks came out of the work we did with focus groups of teachers to begin with and then interactively uh, over a couple of years of in-service. Um, Thirteen recurrent themes, topics, areas of focus in the primary curriculum. We've got one of these primary curricula that's meant to go in a gradually ascending spiral, getting wider and wider. And as you get towards the top and senior primary, then these topics spin off into different subject areas that become the subjects of the post-primary curriculum. And we said to the teachers, well, obviously we're going to have to address these things in different ways for learners of different ages, but, but what, what are the themes? To begin with, they came up with 14. And when after two years we revised uh, the document, we reduced it to 13. The one that went out was water, because I could never quite understand why it was there in the first place, but it seemed to be embraced by the other themes. When we explained this to um, the, the teachers, uh, the, the first in-service that we were presenting the new document to them with, um, the teacher, photographs of whose classroom you will see in a little while, who was one of our absolute stars, looked very sad, and I said, what's wrong with you, uh, Evelyn? She said, I can do wonderful things with water. Anyway. The units of work are, again, grids, behaviorally oriented, and they're restating the global benchmarks in terms of these recurrent curriculum themes. So, so that's, the, that's the curriculum. And from a very early stage, 
we found that teachers were recognizing where their different ESL support pupils were on these scales. They were very quick to say, yes, I've got three at the moment who are working towards the A1 exit point and five working and so on. So that, that seemed to be uh, corresponding to their, uh, to their uh, experience. And by having this staged curriculum, right at the beginning, we were giving them a very simple diagnostic tool that enabled them to determine in very broad terms where their different pupils were. Of course, we had to devise learning supports and what would we, would we devise but a version of the European language portfolio. So we have a language passport that focuses on the pupil's linguistic identity. There are a couple of pages. You can see that that was designed by an amateur working in Microsoft Word. Um, my language passport. These categories are the ones that are used in Irish primary schools for children, especially in a junior school, to describe themselves. There's always focus when their birthdays are and hair and eye color. I don't know why, but that's what they do. Um, with the, the red dotted line is where we encourage the teacher, parents, other contacts to write in the equivalent in the child's home language. We provide teachers with a, a sort of uh, crib chart for about 15 languages. Uh, the latest count, we had more than 200 languages in the system, so that's not going to work. Uh, but in some cases, it's possible uh, for parents or other contacts to come up with translations. Up here, stick your photo or, or draw your picture. This is the developer's naivety because we were slow to recognize how quickly primary schools had got their own digital cameras and had absolutely no problem in, in supplying kids with uh, photographs of themselves. And then a very simple beginning of, of, of language awareness, language as I know. Um, the second one of those bubbles, I speak in school. Um, it's a matter of some sadness and occasionally irritation with the teachers that the immigrant children are among the first to write Irish in that box. And some of them do indeed do very well in Irish. We also, though, in the language passport, provide for regular summative self-assessment. Now, self-assessment. Some of these children are very, very young. Some of them are being introduced to the portfolio as part of their more general introduction to the concept and the practices of literacy. So there's got to be a lot of teacher mediation. And self-assessment is going to be a matter of discussion, of proposal, do you think that it's so, and of the gathering of evidence, proofs, and demonstrations. That's what the receptive page looks like, listening and reading. So A1, I can understand words and phrases about myself, my family and school, and simple questions and instructions. A2, I can understand most instructions given inside and outside school, can follow topics covered in mainstream class, and can understand a simple story. And then B1, I can understand detailed instructions given in school, the main points of topics presented and stories read aloud in the mainstream classroom, and films about things I'm familiar with. I can follow most conversations between other pupils without difficulty. And those three descriptors, I think, help to demonstrate the point I was making in relation to the passport in the other uh, model I was talking about before lunch of the, of the gradually expanding uh, scope of, of, of these levels. Now, you may see here that we're allowing for progression in three steps. You can do things with a lot of help. You can do things with a bit of help. And you can do things independently with no help. And we've always encouraged teachers to avoid simply ticking things. If instead of a tick you write a date, you've got something that cumulatively is going to be a very important source of evidence. And one of the things that this portfolio will be used for is to track learner progress with the possibility that it may be necessary for the school principal to make a case for the pupil to have more than the statutory two years of English language support. So you, you need all the evidence you can gather. 
Uh, one, one teacher liked to use this fortnightly, and in order to keep the idea of progress moving, working back from the checklist that you'll see in a moment, she adopted the practice of turning each of these levels into a nine-step thing. First of all, you write across there and put the date. Then you write from there to the middle and put the date and then there. So you, you, you've got a three-step path through with a lot of help and then three steps there and, and so on. And then we have the language biography and, and that also works away at developing language awareness, language in the environment and also learning how to learn. So you have those two uh, pages, for example. This one needs to be revisited from time to time because circumstances can change. On the street, I see these things written. I mean, there are now streets in Dublin, which no one would have imagined 10 years ago, where none of the shop fronts has got a word of English on it. Um, and, and then that one, how I learn, is, is definitely a page for frequent replacement and, uh, and, and uh, gradual elaboration. And then we have these goal-setting and self-assessment checklists for each of the units of work. There are two, for our school and for seasons, holidays, and festivals. You can see we've got A1, A2, B1. Under each level, we've got at least one descriptor per skill, listening, reading, spoken interaction, spoken production, and writing. So slightly more than 15 times 13 units of work means just above, just over 200 ICANN descriptors mediating the curriculum in terms of theme and communicative task to the learners. And of course, the teachers use these uh, a, gr a great deal. Please. Yes? Well, there, I mean, we devised the curriculum in, in, in those benchmarks that, well, we dreamed that up. And these are then expansions of the compact summary descriptors in the benchmarks. And then we have the, the dossier where we have a table of contents page like that. We have open pages related to the units of work, like that. We have additional worksheets, like that. And of course, it's a place to keep finished work. I, I promised you a site of a classroom. That will have to come after your health break, because I have been working off my laptop and I've been revising the presentations as we go. I took from my memory stick onto the computer here what I arrived with in Fredericton last week sometime, and that doesn't have the pictures, but I'll have to, I'll have to put them on. Um, the advantages of working in this way, well, the ELP itself embodies the dynamic nature of the curriculum. Makes it, it makes it very visible to teachers themselves, to learners, to class teachers, principals, parents, and not least school inspectors. We think the portfolio also makes clear to all these stakeholders an approach to learning that emphasizes learner involvement, reflection, and communicative use of the target language. And it certainly places at center stage a version of the framework's action-oriented approach to language use and language learning that captures the evolving features of autonomous learner users, because all of these things are what they can do of English as a second language. Now, scale of use. The ELP for primary ESL, ESL learners in Ireland is very widely used, not because people say, oh, look, a tool for developing learner autonomy. Not at all. It's used because it mediates the curriculum to learners. It makes things clear to the learners. It's used because it's the foundation for a substantial array of teaching and learning resources. Every time Barbara and I went round the country, which we did for five years, twice a year, we took armfuls and armfuls of new materials of one or another kind. All of that was boiled down into up and away, this resource book here. But there's an enormous amount of stuff. 
and because it supports forms of peer and self-assessment that are fully harmonious with the official tests. Because what we also did was to develop some communicative tests which we got teachers to help us to pilot and, and refine uh, and they were in fact officially launched by our Minister for Integration uh, the day before I came over to Canada. Uh, and, and the bottom line message of this is the ELP will work if it's a good pedagogical tool but it will work on a large scale if it's very explicitly rooted in an appropriate communicative action-oriented curriculum and it ties in with whatever forms of school-based or external assessment are also in place. That at any rate is how we explain the success uh, in our backyard.